Coming up on Foundation for Life with Dr. Whalen Bailey. God, if you could just do this, this would make the earth better. <laughs> this would make the world better. How often have I prayed in that kind of way? What a ridiculous prayer. Oh, what I need to pray is, God, change me. I'm the one. My heart's what needs to be restored. come to the last section of James, and it's as if he leaves the most significant thing for last. But he's got, because he's talking about the church, he's talking about how we relate to one another, he's talking about prayer and how we spend time with God. He is relating to how we help one another and how we restore one another. It's James chapter 5, verse 13. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave, gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. My brothers and sisters, if any one of you should wander from the truth, and someone should bring that person back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death, and cover over a multitude of sins. We need to learn to restore one another. And that's what this passage is about. Now, you may be the one who needs to be restored. Because you may look at your own life and say there was a time in which I was so close to God, so close to the church, so much a servant, and now something has happened, and I'm the one who needs to be restored. How does James tell us to do it? Well, there are four things, and, and what you find is there are four different sections in this passage of Scripture. So there are four ways that we restore, four ways that we can be restored. The first one is we pray for the suffering. Look at verse 13. Is anyone among you in trouble? Well, that would be many of us in trouble. No doubt you know, maybe in your small family, I know of someone who is in trouble. They're struggling. They are afflicted. They are, they are hurting. We all struggle. We all suffer. We all are afflicted. What does James mean by this? Some, some people have said what he meant was there are people who are discouraged. Are you discouraged about something? Is there something that gets you down, that where you need to be restored and you need to be at joy and hope and looking forward to the future? Is anyone among you afflicted in trouble? What does James say? Let them pray. 
Let them go to God. And, and when you go to God, how would you pray? Here's what I would suggest. You say, God, I'm in trouble. I'm struggling. I'm afflicted. I'm discouraged. And then you tell God what you are discouraged about. And God, I want to be restored. I want to have again the joy of my salvation. I want to have again the hope that is in Christ. God, I want to think differently than I thought, and I want to know that you are there for me. The Bible tells us that prayer is a high and holy privilege, and it is a privilege. Over the last few months, I've, I've found myself quoting what a friend we have in Jesus. Now, I, I had to go back and look it up because I've been quoting a little phrase. What a privilege it is to carry everything to God in prayer. And I've told many people when they came to me asking for prayer, I've said it's a privilege to pray. Quoting from that, but I didn't know I was quoting for what a friend we have in Jesus. It's a great phrase. What a privilege it is to carry everything to God in prayer. Prayer is a high and holy privilege. We can go boldly and freely and comfortably and with encouragement to God in prayer. We don't have to go through anybody. In fact, on, we should only go through the Lord Jesus Christ in prayer because of what Jesus did for us, because of his death for us on the cross, because he shed his blood, we can go freely to God in prayer, and we should go freely and boldly to God in prayer. And when we go, we shouldn't be living in grumbling and complaining. James chapter 5, verse 9, what we looked at last week, uh, we aren't to be grumbling and whining before God in prayer or in any other way. And I would say even though there have been a lot, we'll talk about sickness in a minute, even though there's a lot spoken about this, uh, we should trust God and not blame God because God is good. That's who he is. He is good. He is kind. He is loving, and he knows everything. And there is no sense in which we are all of those things. So I don't want to condemn you. I, I don't want to even, I don't want to do anything to hurt you in any way, but think carefully about what you are saying about God. And think again and let Scripture show you who God is and that He is good and that He is kind and that He is loving. And we need to instill that into the lives of our children and grandchildren and into our own hearts and to our own lives. That needs to be the heart of everything that we are and everything that we do. Let us, is anyone in trouble, let them pray. Mature Christians are prayerful in the struggles of life, and you and I want to be mature. And we need to pray, God, make me mature. Teach me, show me, let me learn, instruct me in who you are and what you do. We need to be people who pray. A second thing that we need to do is we need to pray for sinners. In verses, in verses 14, 15, and 16, we are instructed to pray. It is, is anyone sick among you? By the way, in that last verse, we'll go back to verse 13. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing praises to God. I am thankful that even though there are many times when I think I am in trouble, and I admit that I am in trouble, and that I am discouraged, and I am struggling, I am so thankful that many more times I am happy 
And the instruction of God is for me to sing praises to him. So we experience both, and we need to be thankful for the times when we are happy and we are singing praises to God. What do you do if people are sick? Verses 14 and 15 or 16 are hard verses. It seems that he is talking about people who are sick because of sin in their lives. Remember, that is one of the things that the New Testament teaches us, and yet we struggle with it. We struggle about the whole idea. Uh, Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, and he encouraged them, I want you to take the Lord's Supper in a worthy manner. What were they doing? Well, they met together for a communal meal. And those who were better off financially could get there earlier, and they had more food to bring, and they shared it with other people who were better off financially. And they ate up, and they were gluttonous as they ate the meal, and they left out poor believers, many of them slaves who would get there late and had almost nothing to bring and nothing to add to it, and left them out. And Paul said, don't eat the Lord's Supper in a way that is unworthy. Maybe he also talked about our own, our own internal sin and rebellion. Whatever it was, he said these words, for this reason, many of you are sick and some have fallen asleep. Paul's word for death of a believer. And so obviously we have to take that very seriously. Now, let's all understand sickness is a mystery. It's a mystery to me. There are all kinds of times when I don't know what, what made me sick. And let's all admit it's a mystery to all of us. And we should never assume anything about anybody else who is sick. It's not my job to assume that about anybody else. Nor is it your job to assume that about anybody else. But when there is sickness, we need to let the Spirit of God show us if there is something in our life that needs to change. That seems to be what is said in this passage of Scripture. Let's look at it. Is any among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. Most people believe that the reason they're doing that is because the person is too weak to go to the church to make some kind of decision of praying over, so therefore they call because they're too weak. Let them anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith, we're going to talk about the oil, we're going to talk about the prayer offered in faith, will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. So sin fits in this somewhere. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So let's don't talk about anybody else. Let's only look at you look at yourself, I'll look at myself. Let's ask that question. Because there is a mystery to sickness. And there are times we know that people get sick because of the actions they take. If you get away into something else, we know that. My grandfather died at 52 years old. Uh, when I got old enough to talk about that, uh, later on in life, it was very clear to me that, by the way, I was eight years old. On the day he died, my mom and dad came pick me up at school, uh, took me home. It was in the day in which you could ride in the front seat between the two. My dad was driving. My mom was here. I can tell you exactly where I was in Brantley, Alabama. I was eight years old, and they told me my grandfather had died, and I cried and cried. But my grandfather, as much as I loved him, he, he drank and smoked himself to death and died of lung cancer at 52 years old. 
So there, it, there are many things that we do that causes sickness. And it is so clear about that. So, so what do we do? We, 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 we go to the Lord. We pray uh, for sinners. Let's, let's talk about things. What does he tell us to do? He tells us to confess our sin. So there is, are there any among you sick? Yes. What should they do? We should, we should call the elders of the church. Those are respected leaders in the church. They should anoint with oil and in the name of the Lord. In the Old Testament, they often anointed with oil. When it says anointing with oil, that was an Old Testament way of doing it. A, a king would be anointed with oil. When they had a wound, they would put oil on the wound and press it down. You find that several places in the Old Testament. It was seen, up, seen as having medicinal value. In this passage of Scripture, it seems like it has medicinal value. They, they thought of it in that way. So oil was part of that, and prayer was part of that. Put those together. Get other people to pray for you. Call for the elders. So how should you pray? In the Old Testament, this is the way they usually prayed. They lifted hands like this over their head with their palms up and with their head up looking with their eyes open toward heaven. The parable of the publican and the Pharisee. Remember, Jesus talked about the Pharisee. He prayed just in this way. And then he talked about the publican who didn't lift his head, but bowed his head and closed his eyes. And for that reason, most of us pray bowing our head and closing our eyes. Makes good sense. Jesus commended one and didn't commend the other. But the point of what Jesus said was not whether you should stand like this or whether you should bow your head, it was what was in the heart of the two. And that's still the point. Sometimes in my private prayer life, I will pray like this. I am mindful that, that Paul wrote to Timothy and said, let men raise holy hands in prayer. So whenever I do that, I am mindful that these hands should be holy before God. So when I pray that way in private, I, I am aware that my hands must be holy. Sometimes in private, I bow before God. I get on my knees. Sometimes in prayer, I prostrate myself. I lie down flat. Things have really got to be tough for me to do that. But I do. And here's what I would say about this. It is okay for you to raise your hands in prayer. And it is okay for you not to raise your hands in prayer. It's okay for you to bow in prayer. And it's okay for you not to bow in prayer. It's okay for you to prostrate yourself in prayer. And it's okay not to. It is okay to, to anoint with oil. And it's not. And it's also okay not to to anoint with oil. Because throughout Scripture, what God is doing is looking at the attitude on the inside. It's not the elders being present that, that determines that the prayer is answered as we are, we are requesting. And it's not the oil that makes the prayer answered. It's the, the prayer of faith. What's a prayer of faith? A prayer of faith is understanding what God wants and praying according to God's will. It's the understanding that when we pray and ask for forgiveness that God is going to forgive us. What does he say in this passage of Scripture? He says, confess your sin. Well, what does the Bible say? The Apostle John says, if we confess our sin, he, God, or Jesus, is faithful to forgive us 
of all sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He uses the example of Elijah. He talks about the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man which avails much. And then he talks about Elijah. Elijah was a righteous man. God told Elijah to pray that it would not rain for three and a half years, and it didn't rain. And then he tells him to pray that it would rain. So he prayed and prayed and prayed until he saw a little cloud about this high, about this size. And then he kept on praying, and then it rained, and it nourished the ground. Our prayer needs to be something like this. God, I trust you to do as you said you would do, to save, to forgive, to transform, to make people new people. That should never be applied to the selfish desires of our hearts. But it should be applied to what God has told us he is going to do. We must pray prayers of faith, and we must confess our sin. But here's the truth, and I I, I want you to think about this. I want you to look at it. We must never confess sin beyond the circle of that sin's influence. And so, if there is an issue with me and you, and I need to come to you and confess. I don't need to confess to the church. I don't need to do it in front of 40 people. I need to come to you. I need to confess before the person whom I have wronged. Is anyone sick? Is anyone suffering because they've been rebellious against God? Call the elders. Anoint them with oil. Pray over them. Lead that person to confess sin, and he will be forgiven. That's what God wants to happen, that that we will experience that and have that blessing that comes, having that prayer of faith, but confessing our sin. There's a third thing here about how we restore. We pray for the nation, and he uses the example of Elijah. Elijah's prayer was a prayer about the nation. Ahab and Jezebel were ruling the land. They were horrible rulers. They were encouraging idol worship. They were bringing idols into the place of worship worship of the one true God of Israel. Elijah, the man of God, confronted them and faced them. And Jezebel wanted to kill him. And had she had her way, she would have killed him. Elijah prayed. How did he pray? He prayed persistently, and he prayed fervently. Now, I don't know why I need to pray persistently. I don't know why I need to pray fervently, but I know I do. Jesus did not just pray one time in the garden. He prayed three times, which is a picture of completeness and perfection. And Paul didn't pray one time that, that, that uh, the thorn of, in his flesh might be taken from him. He prayed, prayed three times. Elijah did not pray one time that it might rain. He prayed many times that it might rain. And maybe, maybe, the reason for doing that is that Elijah had to trust to keep on praying. I've experienced that in my life. When God showed me something I was to pray about, and when it didn't happen, then I just quit and kind of let it go. That it was wrong on my part. Wrong before God. We are to pray persistently and fervently. Robert Law said this, prayer is not getting man's will done in heaven, See how that is? God, I want this done. I want you to do it for me. But real prayer is getting God's will done on earth where we are obedient and faithful to God. True prayer changes us. It doesn't change God. God's unchanging. God is always good, always right, always loving, always kind. God's will is unchangeable. God's work doesn't need changing. 
what a ridiculous way for us to think of God. God, if you could just do this, this would make the earth better. <laughs> this would make the world better. How often have I prayed in that kind of way? What a ridiculous prayer. No, what I need to pray is, God, change me. I'm the one. My heart's what needs to be restored. I'm the one who needs to be changed. The fourth thing is to pray for wanderers. Look, look at the last two verses, verses 19 and 20. My brothers and sisters, if any of you should wander from the truth, and someone should bring that person back. Remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death, meaning of, of being away from God and, and, and being judged of God. We need to pray for wanderers. What is a wanderer? A wanderer is a person who has the sin of slow, gradual, spiritual decline, wandering away from God like a sheep who, who eats one blade of grass after the the other with its head down and all of a sudden is lost from the flock and lost from the shepherd. That's what a wanderer is. And we need to be people who help wanderers come back to the truth. But what is this passage of Scripture telling us? It is telling us this very important truth, that the sin of a believer, you and me, a sin of believer is worse than the sin of a lost person. We expect unsaved people to sin, but God does not expect His children to be disobedient. And if we are being disobedient, and if we are wandering away from God, and if we're leaving God out of our lives, we need to confess our sin to Him and ask to be restored. And we need to seek to please God in all things. What did the Apostle Peter say? He said that, the, that judgment must begin at the house of God. What he meant is it's, it's about you and me. It's about the church, that we would be the family of God, the people of God, obedient to God. And going out from this place would proclaim the goodness of God to all the world. Live on the North Shore or planning to visit? Join us here at First Baptist Church Covington for one of our three weekend services. Come be encouraged by Dr. Bailey every Saturday evening at 6 or Sunday mornings at 9.30 or 11 a.m. For more information and directions to our church, visit fbccov.org. First Baptist Church Covington. Experience life-changing relationships. Be sure to tune in again next week for Foundation for Life.